Welcome to a Drop Tent Media Production. The Porcupine with Adam Nutter. What's up, everyone? Welcome to The Porcupine. Going to say episode number nine. Sounds right. So welcome to episode number nine of The Porcupine. Uh, Real quick before, as always, we get into the show. This Sunday, I will be on the 25th, uh, July 25th. I'll be up at Comics in Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Get your tickets to that. Go to their website. Uh, And then, again, uh, the big one I always like to talk about. August 14th. Pop in Chalfont, PA. It's right outside of Philly. If you guys want two shows, 7.30 and 9.30 show, August 14th, Saturday night. I'm hosting both shows. Get your tickets, droptenth.com slash events. They will sell out. They sell out all the time. No, I can't get you tickets. No, they're sold out. That's what that means. So get your fucking tickets now. They're already selling. So get on that while you still can. And, of course, check me out for all my other upcoming dates on my social media at Adam Nutter and all the stuff. All right. That is out of the way. Guys, I'm really psyched to have on this guest today. Uh, super, super great guy. I met him via actually kind of Joshua Smith Avenue. We kind of met each other, I think, through that way of Twitter and and, uh, and seeing each other on podcasts and stuff. So I'm glad to have on my man, Josh Cybulski, everybody. What's going on, dude? Uh, on, can you get me tickets to that last thing Absolutely you were talking not. about? <laughs> no? Absolutely it's good. Not. I'm not allowed in the States anyway, so, so that's fine. <laughs> no, we don't want Canadian trash down here. Sorry. So it's American only. No, I'm kidding, <laughs> America's full. America's full. <laughs> we're good. We're full. We don't need more. No, man. Uh, thanks for coming on, of course. Um, for people who don't know you, you released a book. Uh, not recently, actually. I should say recently. Nope. Was, not recently. But you've been kind of getting a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, attention towards the book recently. More right, I would say since you've been on like Josh Smith's show and stuff like that, it's becoming like around full circle again for you. Yeah, it's weird because, like you mentioned, the book came out last September. I kind of got some initial attention for like a couple of months, and then I just was a ghost for like six months. And then, yeah, doing Josh Smith's pod and uh, a few others kind of picked back up for me, which is interesting. It's weird to have a book out a year and be talking about it now, but I don't have anything else out. And uh, I probably won't for a little bit, so it's uh, I'm gonna keep plugging it as much as I can. Dude, fuck yeah, man! Um, just tell everybody the name of your book, of course, and like what it's about. Just a brief, you know, little uh, plot synopsis. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, it is called Second Story Work. It is just about getting it done. You know, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's about <laughs> four buddies who graduate from college, uh, late 2007. They move to Vancouver. Uh, which is in BC up here in Canada, which is like Hollywood North. Uh, They want to work in the film industry. Uh, Basically, 2008 happens. Everybody knows what happened in 2008. The world economy fell apart, so they can't get work. They can't pay their bills. They're desperate, so they turn to crime, and it just kind of snowballs from there. They start out just doing small-time stuff, and it escalates into something much bigger than they could ever comprehend, and that's where it goes from there. It is, uh, I mean, I've had a lot of people message me and be like, dude, this thing is ugly. <laughs> like, it's my pretty little book about ugly little things. Based off anything true or just? Uh... Yeah, man, it's based off. So when I lived in Vancouver, uh, I ended up basically homeless. Uh, I was, you know, couch surfing, that kind of thing. And what ended up happening to me was actually the end of 2008, where um I went home for Christmas, went to visit my family and stuff, went back to Vancouver and my roommate had joined a gang and I basically rolled into my apartment and uh, I'm like, I don't remember 25,000 bucks being on my dining room table. I'm like, I don't remember those bricks being here either. And it was basically like, well, I'm going to leave now. So I'm not, I'm not ever going to come back. And uh, basically I called my roommate. He was supposed to pick me up at the airport. He's like, oh yeah, dude, I meant to tell you I joined a gang. I was like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, heads up would have been nice. I like um, how it's a, so it's ba- kind of a major, I feel like, part of your life is gang. If you're joining a gang, it's like, oh, I, I, I got eggs. And then I joined a gang over the weekend too. I don't know if it's a big deal or not, but you know, and what's, what's up with you? You know, it's like, it's very yeah, casually. exactly. <laughs> Oh, dude, it was so it was so weird. He was so casual about it. Like it was just like you say, it was like getting groceries or something like that. But the funny thing was, he's like, dude, I lost my job. What was I supposed to do? I was like, I don't know, like try to get another one like a normal human being would do. But (laughs) that that wasn't uh, that wasn't how he operated. So um, at that point, I started couch surfing and I was looking for a job myself. And 
basically I was like, well, I got a lot of free time. I'm just going to try to write something. And I kind of write it from his perspective, like what he was going through. And I started imagining like, where's his life going to go? you know, getting into, you know, the criminal underworld, it's probably not going to go well for him. And I started kind of imagining, you know, what this snowball was going to turn into. And that's sort of what kicked off the book. Now, this was in 2009 that I started writing it. And I didn't release the book till last year. So it took me 12 years to write it because I just kept putting it down. And I'd be like, ah, you know what, I'm not feeling it. And then I would pick it back up, you know, a year or two later, be like, oh, yeah, this was all right. And I would just start working on it again. And then I'd kind of get bored with it and do it again. But I mean, I'm a scatterbrain. My head's all all over the place. So like right now I'm trying to write four different books and I got people telling me, they're like, why don't you just pick one and just write the one? I'm like, yeah, but four is way more than one. Meanwhile, it'll take me 12 years to write one of the four. Anyways, that's just the way I operate. You and I talked a little bit about it. My uh, <laughs> having so many concussions as a kid. It's just, I think that's <laughs> that all ties into it. Yeah. Uh, all, well, yeah. So that's interesting. The brain trauma stuff for sure. Because I think... Uh... I don't know if that's it helps with creativity or not. Like I'm going to, I'm going to bro science and say it does, but there's no way it does. I mean, it might, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe we think of things differently because of, we don't have a normal yeah. line of thought maybe. So it maybe I, I'm not even saying it's a good creative, but it's definitely, I would say a more creative outlet than I would say most non head trauma people. I also think it's weed and the mushrooms I do on occasion that also helps me expand my mind. But I think, I don't know, maybe the head trauma definitely makes me look at things a different perspective. I have no idea. I think so. Like I, you know, going back to when I was a kid, I had a lot of head injuries as a kid. My dad used to joke. He's like, we need to get you looked at because you're getting real dumb. I'd be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, I think there is something to that. The fact that, you know, your, your brand bounces around in your skull a bunch of times as it's kind of developing and you are going to look at things differently. I don't know if it's good or bad, but yeah, I've, I've never looked at the world like anybody else that I know. Um, I remember the first time I ever met somebody who was like us, like kind of, you know, leaned Liberty or however you want to put it. I remember the first time I met somebody like that, I was like, you're not normal. And then I started having this like internal thought, well, maybe I'm not normal either. You know, I don't see the world like everybody else, but I do think it ties into, you know, how your brain does develop, whether it be you're doing, you know, like you mentioned, you know, different like weed and stuff like that. Or if you just, you know, get your head popped a bunch of times as a kid. Yeah. Who knows? No, dude, I get it. I played a uh, goddamn football for what, 12 to 25, like, you know, full contact. <laughs> like, and then the MMA yeah. on top of that. Like, yeah, I'm all fucked. And the car accidents. I, yeah, I'm all fucked up. <laughs> it's, it's not great. It's, it's such, yeah, yours is such an American way to hurt yourself. Mine's the ultimate <laughs> Canadian way. Like I hurt my head playing hockey a bunch of times. I slipped on ice a bunch of times. I got hit by a car once. That didn't help either. Of I, I, uh, I heard you fought a whole school of beaver one time. Is that also a Canadian <laughs> thing? You guys do? It's a bright yeah. passage, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was, I uh, fell off their dam and hit my head on the way down. Yeah, that was exactly right. <laughs> it's funny. You mentioned beaver. Everybody has this idea of like Canadian beavers. I couldn't, I don't even remember the last time I saw a beaver. I'd be I'd be hard pressed. I to remember. guarantee you, I've seen beavers way more than you do living in Pennsylvania. I'm not even kidding. I, I I've seen a beaver like not too long ago. I saw one. <laughs> like not too long ago. <laughs> yeah, for real. I think the last time I saw one was probably when it was when I was in Pittsburgh. Yeah, Seen they're all over there. here. Yeah. They're fucking all over PA. I think they make our waterways or something like that. I have no idea. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Let me ask you about uh. So, comparing libertarianism to your book, I guess. Like, was that in your mind at all while writing it? Like, liberty stuff, or you were just like, nah, this is just pure fiction. It has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with liberty or freedom or you know Canadian politics. Just separate. Like, or is it blended? Yeah, it's kind of blended. Yeah. Um. So you know, getting into when I first started writing it. I was, I was a big fan of Obama <laughs> in 2000, January, 2009. I literally started writing it the day he got inaugurated and I started writing it because I had this optimism, him going in. I was like, hope and change. Yay. Like, you know, he's going to end the wars. <laughs> he's going to stop bailing out the banks and all this stuff. And then he did all those things. And that really yeah. is kind of, you know, at the time when I started writing it, I had no intention of putting anything political in it or having really any you know narrative about the drug war or anything like that but as i started to get disillusioned through his presidency as a lot of people did who liked him um i started to kind of just subvert little things here and there about the drug war about the wars like one of the characters is uh had served in afghanistan um and he's very disillusioned about 
you know, foreign policy and things like that. And he talks about it a few times in the book, talking about, you know, things that happened when he was in Afghanistan. He would talk to people who had been to Iraq and what a gong show it was and all that kind of stuff. So I did subvert a lot of those narratives in there. Now, I don't beat people over the head with it because I didn't, I didn't want to chase people who read the book away. But I also want to like instill in them that these things aren't right. And I'm not going to preach or, you know, give them my opinion on it. But from the character's perspective, the character doesn't think it's right. And I hope that when people read it, they're like, yeah, that is pretty, you know, it's pretty messed up that that is going on in Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff like that. But it's pretty messed up that the drug war creates these black markets and stuff like that. So I definitely put it in there. I didn't beat people over the head with it, though. That's cool. I think that's a good. Um, it's hard. to. We were talking about uh, we had the our LP uh, county meeting last night and we were, a few of us were talking about this, like when you're trying to recruit people into libertarianism or bring people to the idea of the party or just the idea of liberty, it, it, you have to crack that like candy shell outer belief of them. Cause everyone, and this is just a human being thing. This is even a political thing, right? Like if you question somebody's beliefs on anything, their first, everybody's first instincts be like, fuck you. No. And they put their you know hands in the dirt and they push back on it. So you have to now do that with their politics. And then especially what we're trying to do is like, Hey, like everything, you know, is wrong. <laughs> like, so it's like, it's even harder for people to understand that. So you're fighting so many levels of, of stubborn, not stubbornness, even just belief in, in, in tradition and culture and everything. You're, you're trying to combat that. It's very fucking hard to do. So I think you throwing in just at least crumbs. That's the best way I think to get people involved. That's how I noticed it myself. Even recruiting people into the party and moving myself is you, is you find the thing they don't like, you know, and they'll be like, uh, let's just say taxes just for hypothetical. Some guy's like, yo, I'm getting fucking ripped on taxes on my check. I'm like, oh, you don't like you being taxed, huh? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I have a party here that's very against taxes, you know? And they're, <laughs> and they're like, oh, what's that about? And then you're like, oh, the Libertarian Party. And they're like, what's the Libertarian Party? And you go, oh, we're pretty much for individual liberty and like, you know, we're against government intervention for uh, for your money. Like, you know, it's your, and, then, and then you start talking about like, you know, uh, soul and like basic e economics and all, and you introduce them to all that stuff. And then they're like, huh. And then, you know, maybe... And so I know too. It's not like a week. It's not a month, but four, six, a year from now, I'll get that same dude being like, "Hey, man, you get any more books about that uh, libertarian stuff?" Because like I read the first stuff and I like I really, really understand. And, like I really, I agree with it. And like, you have anything else? And you're like, "Yeah, I do." Here's Anatomy of the State. You know, like the 101. You know, Murray Rothbard thing to get through somebody. Yeah, it's a that yeah. shit. That's how you do it. So I think it's very important what you're doing. It is. You can't like, there's that joke from Seinfeld where she's, where Elaine's like, I'm not trying to make any big sudden movements. You know, I'm yeah. trying to, <laughs> you know, it's talking about that. That's the thing that we do way too much is make huge sudden movements and just chase everybody off. And they just kind of write us off, which I get. I mean, a lot of us are nuts, myself included. Same. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for us, it is really hard. And we kind of, we, we do, like you say, we look at things a little differently. So we do have to approach, you know, lefties from the left, righties from the right, as Scott, Scott Horton always says. Mm -hmm. And there is really something to that. And you mentioned the eggshell theory, like people are very protective of that small shell that kind of holds in everything that they know. And they don't like it, the idea of it being kind of broken and all of their beliefs being sort of like left to the world to be exposed because people do inherently have like a belief system and they don't like it to be one question, but two kind of disproven. And I know like for me, when I started to figure out that everything I believed was wrong, like going back to, you know, 2009, 2010 for me, like being a fan of Obama and then seeing what he did in like Libya and Syria yeah. and being like, Oh yeah, he didn't do anything. He said he would do. He actually did the complete opposite. And that was like a big moment for me where I was like, I just kind of everything that I believe was like, oh, that, you know, that's not true or what have you. And that's a tough thing to go through, like physically and like mentally, you're just uh -huh. like everything I thought was wrong. I was like dead wrong on everything. And that's hard for people to deal with. And most people don't want to deal with it. Oh, when I was well, I was again, I was uh, uh, in high school during 9-11 and I didn't understand like, you know, all of the things around it <laughs> as i do yeah. now and so as a kid in high school and i'm from new york and like i'm from staten island so like we saw you know like that was very it hit us directly 9 11 home like people i know did, were died from you know worked that day like uh one of our classmates like one of my direct classmates his mom died that day in the, in the fucking towers like you know so like it was it hit us differently and it was all rah 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 like, go kill is get revenge so like you know my young teenage mindset i'm like yeah fucking kill it and then 
Then you get to 2008, and you're like, oh, all right. <laughs> like it's like yeah. five, literally five years go by, and, and then you just you become a little older. And you're like, ah, oh, I see where where this is going, and then and then it, it still takes a little while. It still hits you, like it still shatters shatters you, because you go from like, oh, we're just getting revenge for the people that died, and then you realize like, oh, it's not what happened. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, it's not. No, what we we're ended doing. up in it's, Iraq. <laughs> yeah, we're in Iraq for no fucking reason. It's like we're just now we're just killing them for no reason. It's you know, and like, and, which is uh, I always. People are always like, oh, we're, we're there for our freedom. No, we're not. <laughs> yeah, how is, how is it over there? Yeah, how is it over there? I, I heard a, this is a great example I, I, I heard or one time where it was like, uh, imagine Iran or Iraq invaded Canada and Mexico in like the 50s and just took over and then intermittently bombed America and killed Americans for like 50 years. And then finally an American was like, hey, you know what? Fuck you. And took over an embassy and they were like, whoa. These hostile motherfuckers. It's like that's what we did to yeah. them. So it's 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 the same fucking thing. It's like we go over there, we invade everything, and then they kind of fight back, and we're like, these savages are fucking wild, and they hate us. <laughs> they hate our freedom. It's like no man, it's not really what happened at all. And when you tell people that, and they get very defensive, and like you hate the troops, I'm like, okay, whatever. And it's like you yeah. know, you hate like, America. Yeah, you hate America. It's like no, I love America, and I'm telling you, I don't want Americans dying over nothing. The fact mm-hmm. that you're so willing to send America, I know, uh, for your case, Canadians, but like in our case, you're so willing to send American uh, men and women over to die for nothing is psychotic to me. And the yeah. fact that I get pushed back on that and you get pushed back on that is wild. You, you know, I'm sure a lot of a lot of vets will tell you. I uh, a guy last night from the Bucks County party, LP party, he just came to his first meeting and he was a vet. He was in Iraq. He was in Afghanistan, and he was like, he's like, yeah, I was. In, he realized while there. That they shouldn't, we shouldn't be there. He's like, fine, I'm fucked. Now I'm here. <laughs> but yeah. I can't leave. You know, yeah. so I get it. It's it's rough. Yeah, it is. And uh, you mentioned like from the like the Canadian perspective, we we obviously went with you guys to Afghanistan. We didn't go to Iraq, uh, yeah. and that was a big deal for a lot of Canadians. Like conservatives in Canada were not a fan of not going. Like it it really rubbed a lot of conservatives the wrong way. Uh, I had actually just started in journalism when that started to pop off. And I used to get in fights all the time with people about it because I knew like reading stuff that I was like, these are all like, these can't be true. Like the stuff that like Cheney and, you know, Colin Powell and all of them are released. I'm like, there's no way. And I was like a 19 year old kid. And I'm like, there's no way. But yet everybody else is looking at it. They're like, yep, well, it's in here. So it has to be true. And it's like, okay. And then, you know, a couple of years later, I realized that I was right about, you know, quite a few things. And the people that were in that business with me in journalism were wrong. And they still, most of those people are still in journalism. And a lot of them hold like very high positions in Canadian journalism. And it's like, they were reporting all the stuff that turned out to not be true. That's because they're working for the CIA. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how they're there. I oh, for, from the CBC? <laughs> Dude, uh, they, they, hey, you know the CIA. They work with everybody. Anybody that can that's help true. This, uh, put that message out there they want. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the stories of uh, every morning uh, all the major news heads call someone from the CIA to get the message of the day. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't yeah. doubt it. I mean, they're definitely in the LPMC. Like I would, I would put money on that that they're in the the Mises Caucus for uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I for sure think we have plants in the for sure the LP, a hundred percent, hundred percent. But uh, I I heard um someone just someone was just talking about it. They said the day the LP was formed, it was formed with feds in the room. Yeah, the I've FBI heard that too. was in the room when the LP was formed. Like so, if yeah. that doesn't tell you that every single party is compromised by the feds, it's like it's like, so yeah. But we were talking about that ourselves. I'm like, hey, even the MC, I don't, which is sad. I don't want to say, mm. but it's true. We, you, I can't be dumb to that either. Like, I'm sure we have plants in the MC. So who the fuck do we For trust sure. in the MC too? Well, you know what? I don't know if you ever were any part of like We Are Change back in like 2012. Nope. Anything like that? Okay, so there were a ton of plants in We Are Change. And you would know them because they would be the people who would every so often they would spew off little bits of like violent language or violent, however you want to verbiage, whatever you want to describe it as you knew that those were the plants and you knew to like, don't talk to them. Oh, then I'm basically because I say we should kill pedophiles all the time. (laughs) Yeah. See, (laughs) so you are the plant. No, but for real, like 
if you see that in like and you know what credit to uh to heist and like uh steven and jeff and all of them they've done Mm -hmm. a good job of like getting people who who talk that kind of stuff getting them out of the group as quickly as possible but if you see that definitely do not associate with that person and get rid of them as quickly as possible because that is most likely like that is what they're trying to instigate and you know credit to uh, how many people are in the facebook group like nine thousand. oh i think something uh, easily, like that easily like credit to them for just being on top of like when people do talk that way they are gone right away mm-hmm. and we don't yeah. and we really don't need that in in that group and i mean i'm a canadian talking to americans but you know, I, I have seen it from time to time and it's gone pretty quick, which is good because in the past that's been, and you know, Kokesh would probably talk about this too, Adam Kokesh. Yep. Like he's definitely had them in his circle as well. And uh, yeah, like Luke Rudkowski with uh, We Are Changed, they definitely had them in there too. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a, well, not only do I think it's necessarily fed plants in the MC group, that might be starting, but even like, uh, let's say cathedral guys and gals or like, or other different colleagues who are, who will go make fake profiles, put a Mises banner under their name and go in there and just spew shit. And then they'll screenshot it, send it back to their friends. Like, look what the Mises guys are saying in the private chat. Well, it's like, well, it's actually you. You're just lying. Yeah. You're just, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Did you catch that Ficatarians podcast the other day? Well, how could I miss it? I, I listen, I only watched <laughs> a little bit of it. Because I wanted to hang myself, but <laughs> what I did catch was legitimate lies. Like they oh, were, for li- sure. they were lying. Like I know for a fact that, like with their especially the Bucks County stuff, like that's directly I was in- I'm involved in that. Like that's my county. Yeah. I'm a I'm an officer of the county. I'm a, one of the I'm the board rep. Like I, we were all involved in that. Those were lies. Everything that was hmm. said was lied. Like that's not what happened. Those chain of events is not how that went down. So like, but they just get on there and they say it. And they say it, and it's true because they fucking said it, and they'll yeah. all at, and they'll all believe that it's it's a uh, what's the fucking uh no uh, pathological lying. You, they mm. believe their own shit. They, like he knows what he's saying is for sure not true because he was yeah. part. Like he's the reason he's not part of the t- uh, Mon- Montgomery County anymore. Like you know, it's like you did fucked up shit. Then you started running your mouth, and you and people you're being uh. Uh, out of decorum for, for party meetings, you got kicked out. You weren't following the rules. You got, no one ousted you. Like, but he went on this podcast and and, and just you know said it, <laughs> and they're all like, yeah, "Yeah, man, the MC's evil." We didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> we, we literally said you didn't follow the fucking rules that have nothing to do with us. Yeah, you, you know, it's just that's what we have to fight all the time. That's what we're fighting. We're fighting liars. We're fighting projection. Yeah, big time. And that's something too. If you keep doing that, like if you keep telling yourself a story and you tell it over and over, eventually it becomes your version of the truth because you kind of forget what the truth actually is. Yeah. And that's, that is something that a lot of people, especially in social media, really people get lost in that a lot. And it's, I don't think it's healthy because you got to bet that that's going to spill over into your real life at some point. And then you're going to find yourself lying to everybody. Like not just, if you lie online, you're probably going to lie in your personal life too. Dude, I, I've talked about this on this podcast for like a hundred fucking times, but fuck it. Uh, it's like it's these guys and girls, mostly guys, who they'll go on Twitter and just again they'll call you and me racist bigots, and then I see the same person in a meeting two days, you know, after the tweet. I'm like, what's up, man? Am I still a racist bigot piece of shit that you want to see dead? Because say it to my fucking face now. Oh, you're yeah. not. Got it. <laughs> like that's how they all go. Like the mm-hmm. P- the PA State Convention, that's what the whole convention was. All these people who for a whole year just called all the whole entire Mises caucus, you know, all these terrible things. Well, when we all showed up, they didn't say shit to us. Yeah. Josh has talked about that a few times too, where he shows up to stuff and he's like, What's up? What's up? You know, you had all this to say. They don't say anything. You know? They don't no. do shit. And they're like, oh, I want to violate the NEP. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's, it's not a violation. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to fight me. Is that a violation of the NEP? I'm telling you. <laughs> Come on. I'll go. I'm saying it. Like, it's, they, they don't. It, it's, it's this, it's this low T, weak coward shit that I'm not for. It's like, it's like yeah. uh, we're here to benefit the party. We're here to grow the party. You know, the same people saying that we don't do shit. Well, those same people, I didn't see them helping collect signatures for one of our guys over the last two weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, but the whole, the entire Mises caucus was out there collecting signatures for him. Yeah, 
you know what I'm saying? It's like, where's the follow yeah. through what you say? Dave Smith had a good point. It was a few weeks ago. It might even be been like a month ago where he said like, like either help us or just get out of the way. Mm-hmm. Cause you're not doing anything standing in our way. Like it's inevitable that this, this is going to be, you know, it is going to be the Mises caucus party very yeah. soon. Mm-hmm. And you either get a, you get on board or you just get out of the way. Cause you're just done like delaying the inevitable. What's is there? Cause a lot of them are resigning now. Uh, mm. forget the controversy for the state at the state at the new hampshire stuff and the and the party chair forget even that aside like a lot of people resigned mm. once all the states started going mc pretty much so yeah. what's their game plan is it just to start their own party or to really try to railroad this as long as they can i think it's the latter yeah i think i think that is the plan yeah just try to cause as much problems as they possibly can and they sort of they know it's coming it's just they're going to try to delay it as long as they can but how does that benefit anybody it doesn't that, i think it's a, just kind of a game to them it's a social club i think so and you know what credit to uh to nick uh ashley because he recognizes i i'm pretty sure like i haven't spoke to him about this but i'm pretty sure he recognizes it that it's that it's all a game to them and he's kind of now playing it against them because and you know for nick his He's got, you know, a decent sized audience, but he's not to the level of like Dave or, yeah, or anybody course. like that. Yeah. But he recognizes that this is the game that they're playing and he's playing it against them. He's playing it way better than they are. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing because we don't need like Dave tied up in that because Dave's got, you know, bigger things to deal with than a group who's got like, you know, 150 YouTube subscribers exactly. and credit to Nick because he's entertaining as hell at doing this too. And it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and dude, he's I, a super I, smart guy. No, I keep, I keep saying that to people like, uh, especially other people in, in the MC who are like trying to run for positions and stuff. I go, I go, listen, guys, don't engage in this shit. I'll do it. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm a comic. I can't lose my job. Like this is what I do. Right. So like I'll talk shit. Like I'll get I'll get involved in the fray. Like you guys go actually, you know what I'm saying? Like d- go run for shit, promote that stuff. I'll handle these clowns. Like I'll w- we have guys to do that. D- mm. like Dave doesn't need to, Dave doesn't need to do that anymore. Dave's past that. I'll do it. Yeah, he is. I'll be his foot. I'll be his foot sol- soldier. On. <laughs> it's fine. I don't give a shit. Like we yeah. again, me, Nick, jo- like we have guys. Even not even so much Josh anymore. Josh never. Josh move on past it too, because mm. he's uh, he's a great fucking power in the liberty movement. You know, like, again, me, Nick, like, guys, like, dummies like us do it. <laughs> like, yeah. like, fucking Dave Casey, like, let us fucking do it. Like, we'll talk shit. You know, like, don't get involved in that. Yeah, we need, I mean, we need the people who are recruiting to to keep recruiting. Like, and that's what Dave is and Josh and, you know, even uh, Clint, too. Yeah. Uh, Liberty Lockdown. Mm-hmm. Like, he, those guys are guys that are going to recruit to the movement. Whereas, like, I mean, I, I'm sure Nick could, too. Uh, you probably could as well, but probably to a lesser degree. I'm oh, sure you yeah. agree with that, 100%. but like, let, let those guys do that part. Exactly. And we kind of focus on the, uh, hanging out in the, I don't know what you call it. The underbelly, the I guess. Right. The fringe. Sure. <laughs> the, yeah. That works. The, the fringe, the dirt. fringe uh, class. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the fact that like, I just, I just recruited two people to like our local party. And that was like a big, I was like, dude, awesome. I can't believe I did that. Like, that's a big deal. And then Dave's doing it in like thousands, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. But so, yeah, but like, good. Let, but let him do that. Like, mm-hmm. let him. That's what he's great at. The message. And that's yeah. that's important. The message. And that's the other argument is like, what's more important, the message of putting people in office. The message puts people in office. Mm-hmm. In my opinion. Yeah. But. Yeah. That's just me. Uh, we're not putting anybody in office anytime soon. No, we're definitely not. Uh, you did thank the LPMC in the mm-hmm. book. Uh, which I did, is, which is cool. So, what did you actually thank them for, like indirectly, just the idea of like liberty and like the drug battle and kind of? It was more like uh, it was more Josh and uh, and Heiss. Um, so years ago, the first the first person ever reached out to me was Josh, and then shortly after it was Heiss, and it was around the time that they had like a hundred people in the Facebook group. Yeah, and I was kind of like, oh, like you know this is pretty neat. And it was around 2017 (laughs) and just watching those guys really like inspired me the way they would message and talk to people and the way they reached out to me. And they were, they've always been really cool with me, both of them. I mean, I talked to Josh all the time, uh, heist, like we're friends on Facebook. I think we've only talked a handful of times, but, um, you know, both are good dudes. They've always been really nice to me. So I just, the fact that they kind of inspired me to keep pushing my book 
And at the point at that point, I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to release this. And then watching them kind of grow their audience, I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. So that was a bit of inspiration for me. No, that's and great. then Josh has obviously pushed my book to his audience too, which is really helpful. Yeah, jo- jo- Josh is fucking great with that, man. Like shout out to Josh Smith, dude. Like he like he's helped me out so much too, just by promoting me. Like yo, this dude's funny. Fucking follow him, dude. I've got yeah. like fucking 150, 200 followers from Josh alone. On Twitter, like it's fucking crazy. Like, yeah. yeah before his episode even aired, he had he had got like four people to buy my book before I even like went on his show. He's just oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, I'm ha- I'm having this guy, and then like I just watched. Oh, I sold the book, sold the book. Like before I even did the show, same day, it was cool. Yeah, man. That's and that's also what I love about like what we're doing is like we're all like promoting each other's shit and being like, yo, man, go listen to this dude. Like, go listen to this girl. Like, go listen to this. Like, what? It's like they're smart. They really get. They get it. They get the movement. They're funny. Like they they can mix this well. It's like. And then, again, you you talk to the other side, and they're like, "We're out there doing stuff." Is like, I'm like, "You podcast bros." I'm like, "My podcast bros recruit more people than you do." What are you talking about? Yeah, you're not. You don't even get fifty people listening to you. We're getting hundreds, thousands. Uh, again, for some people, like, I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and tens of thousands in some cases. That's what I'm saying. Like, you look at Dave or Tom or any of them. It's like we are doing the work. We're the one bringing people to the party. Yeah. You're complicit, which is how it was. Be, just our local Bucks County meetings alone, before the MC got involved, there was four people attending. Wow. Last, Not this last meeting because it's the summertime, but the meeting before this, there was 40 people, 45 people wow. who showed up. So it's up tenfold. Literally ten. Yeah. So it's, it's like, and, and then they're going to be like, well, that's because of our message. It's like, no, it's because of us. It's directly because of us. We're yeah. d- the direct ones because of it. It's not you. It's it's whatever. It's beating a dead horse, but they don't want to fucking learn. Um, yeah. you, you got to be out here by two thirty or two forty five. Yeah, two thirty. All right, shit. All right, then I do. I guess perfect time to talk about the Dave Crowley stuff. Yeah, sure. Because I know you want to talk about that. And when you first brought him up to me, I again, I my brain trauma. So I'm like, this name sounds familiar. And then you're like, Gray State. I was like, Gray State. That's it. And the whole controversy around him is he was a vet had PTSD, but saw the fucking horrors of the government, right? Came mm-hmm. back, was trying to make a movie, like a crowd indie movie about kind of like a futuristic dystopian Orwellian type government. Yep. And then he killed his family and himself. That's what they say. But then apparently they're like, nah, that's not, that's bullshit. Well, I mean, that's, that's my opinion. But that's a lot, that's, no, but that's, that's like, it's like a major, that's basically like, the rundown. Yeah. That's what I've heard from a lot of people though. Not just you. That's like a major thing I've heard. It's like an Epstein cover up, but not in a bad, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like a, you know, like shut the fuck up. We're killing you. And then you could blame it on PTSD. That, that's the thing about that, man. Is that could, uh, it's, it's such an easy out, right? If you really do want if you really wanted to fake a murder. Yeah. You could be like, yeah, PTSD. oh yeah, for sure. There you go. The funny thing is, is there's no sign. There's never, there's like no reports ever of him having any, anything ever happened that remotely resembled that. That's just kind of something that was inserted as like, oh, it was probably this, but there's, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. And they kind of went on down this list of like the reasons that it happened or that he did it. It was like, oh, it's money problems. And then they looked at the bank accounts and they're like, oh no, they got savings. They have no debt. They're pretty, you know, responsible with their money. The kids in private school, they're how they pay their bills, you know. So oh, it's not that. And then they just went on down to the next thing. They're like, oh, well, he probably snapped because of PTSD. And then it's like, well, there's no evidence of that either. Right. And then they just kept going on down the list. And they did that not, and they did that for everything, not just like the the motive, but they did it for like the evidence and stuff like that. So basically, what happened was they had a dog in the house, and the dog like tore things up for. So they were in the house roughly like three weeks after they were deceased and basically their dog tore up the house and like you know contaminated all the evidence Mm. and what ended up happening was when the police went in basically everything that was like irregular about the crime scene they just went well it was the dog it was the dog like Mm. for example so david was missing his right hand what and they're just like yeah the, the dog ate it oh yeah yeah he had no right hand and they're like yeah the dog ate it and then his the wife was missing both hands. I didn't know any of this. Oh, dude. It, it, so both hands missing. The kid was missing one arm. 
what dog like okay so yeah, i get it a dog dude i'm sorry no and it's no. not a big dog it's like a 25 30 pound no dog. man no dogs ripping off arms even three weeks old you're not ripping off arms dude no and like even if you don't have food why would you rip arms like why yeah there's you like just eat hands ligaments literally yeah, and bones and things wolves, like that. wolves in the wild don't go yeah, let me get that paw real quick bro <laughs> you know they go for torso <laughs> and neck and face like they go for yeah. like meat not your fucking oh, hand and arm exactly and that was like undisturbed that's wild. um yeah so that's just like one small little detail where you're like that just doesn't make sense and it goes on down the list so another thing when they when you listen to the 911 or the uh, the actual police going into the house they go in the back door of the house and they're like yeah back door is open ajar and then they're like no sign of forced entry well it's like yeah cuz the door's open <laughs> it's an open door you just right. walk right. right but they're like uh and that's like they made sure to put that in their report no sign of forced entry it's like yeah the door's open right they people just walk right in it was open and it was slightly ajar too like it was unlocked and ajar now it wasn't enough that the dog could get out but it's interesting okay that really doesn't make sense and then you go into so i've basically like read the reports inside and out i've i pretty much know everything about the case for the most part um but there's huge inconsistencies there's like no blood in the house at all so three miss, gun, so three gunshot missing victims limbs and there's mm. no, I'm, I'm assuming if you tear an arm or a hand off, you're probably going to lose a lot of blood. <laughs> you would I'm, think so. I'm not a doctor, yeah. but <laughs> you know, interesting. Yeah, there's none of that. There's no, I mean, there's three gunshot victims. There's no blood. Well, there's very little. Um, there is also, so the gun was placed next to his left hand, but he's right-handed. So there's that. Um, yeah, huge voids of blood. And then you look at, so his quote unquote suicide note was left on his keyboard of it or on his um computer so no hand and it wasn't even that it just yeah it wasn't even handwriting it just said uh, i loved you all with all of my heart and that was what he wrote on his computer allegedly um but if you look at so there's blood on some of the keys of the computer but it's not on the letters that he would have used to type that which is weird that doesn't really make sense um so there's just all these little things you go through there's like i could probably write a 500 page book on the inconsistencies of this scene and the crazy thing to me is I've never seen anybody talk about it, any libertarian, not one. And like, it was like Hollywood made a movie out of this and like the press had a field day with it, both like Fox and like, you know, the New Yorker and the New York times and all these things, they had a field day. Cause it was an opportunity to like, just, well, look at this crazy guy, this crazy all right guy. It wasn't all right, but right. that's what they said. Yeah. But like, that was an opportunity for them to just, destroy him in the press and on in this movie so the movie's called the gray state it's a documentary right. but it is like it might as well be a mockumentary it is there's so many voids in the movie so like he documents everything going to iraq he takes video of everything that he does and then like six months before he dies they don't play any more videos for the like for the rest of the movie it's just people talking about him for like the last 35 minutes of the documentary it's like well, where's the videos from those six months just conveniently there's nothing it's interesting. Yeah, it is. I definitely recommend people check out the documentary and then kind of decide for themselves. But if you want to read an interesting case that no one, I've never heard a single one of us talk about, that's the one. And it's weird that nobody has talked about it. And I posted in the LPMC about it. I was like, hey, does anybody know this? And either people didn't know or were like, yeah, you know, I haven't really talked about that in years. It's like, why like yeah, that's that a is big weird. deal that is that it is, is weird. weird that is, that is weird because we talk about everything why not yeah i mean yeah you would think like, like that didn't would be... kill himself <laughs> and it's like yeah and that's a weird yeah I, and i look at it like if you're not going to take that on you're not going to take on anything because that's like a small case in a small town that was like in middle america that has and i don't think any it had anything to do with like feds or anything like that i think it was just like somebody who knew him you know, set that stage and really? set that whole thing up. Yeah. Oh, so you don't That's think it I was think. a government silencing? No, I really? don't think so at all. He didn't, he didn't have a big enough audience for them to do that. I don't believe so. No, I think it was somebody that knew him. But why, why do that then? What's the motive there? Uh, well, he had, he had a lot of movie deals he was working on with different people and they were all, a couple of them fell apart. And I think there was a lot of hard feelings money wise as well. And then, or, and a lot of people that, 
you know, he had made promises to that maybe didn't come to fruition. So you wonder if there's something there. Like, I don't know anyone or no one know the particulars of like who it would be, but I suspect given all of the evidence, it was probably somebody he knew. Well, that, that, that makes it okay. Cause when you talk about the cops and all that stuff, I was like, it'll make sense if it's a, it's a, if it's an official cover up, then everyone's going to be like, play dumb. But if the Fed or local state, whatever, had nothing to do with it, then why wouldn't they do a better job investigating the fucking murder? Well, I see I, what I think it comes down to is small town police. So the where it happened is called Apple Valley, Minnesota. It is about 20 minutes outside of Minneapolis. If you've ever dealt with small term, small town police, they don't deal with no, murders yeah, and things like yeah. that. And they get a triple homicide. They don't know what to do. <laughs> They're not trained for, for that kind of thing. So I think it was a case of combination of like ineptitude and once they realized they had made a mistake they started to cover their tracks a little bit so i think it was you know just bad police work and then they just kind of doubled down on it after the fact once they realized like oh sh- you know we're in tr- we missed some stuff we better cover our tracks that's here. still a pretty cover brutal, ourselves. brutal way to why kill the whole fucking fan I, that's what i'm saying I, that's why it makes me think of more of the government cover up than it is some guy being like no nah, i'm salty <laughs> yeah i don't know that it necessarily was something that was planned it's hard to really say you you look at the scene and there's a lot of stuff that's there that points to it being staged um so like there's a notepad in his office and it conveniently the pen is placed just so on top of the notepad like just to say this is the pen that was written on this notepad but like the writing is like scribbled and then there's another part on the page that's like written very neatly So it's like all these things are kind of inconsistencies and they also threw a lot of like, if it was staged, they, they made a point of like just throwing as much stuff against the wall as they could to just confuse the police. I think so. Like there was a, um, there was like writing on the wall and blood. And I think that was there to confuse the police. There was also, um, trying to think of what else there was like, um, a Quran laid out on the floor. That was also, I think, was put to confuse the police, kind of throw them in different directions. But there's all these weird things that were done that were just there to, I think, confuse people. Why not kill the dog? (laughs) That's just it, right? right? I mean, if you were the owner of the dog, wouldn't you do that? Like, I don't know. To me, if you're, if you snapped. Even if he did snap, and that is what happened, why not kill a dog? And if he was murdered, why not kill the dog? You're going to kill the kid and the wife. Why not kill the fucking dog? All of it's very fucking weird. Here's another thing. They never found the bullet. They never found the bullet that killed him. How do you not find the bullet? Like if he, well, it's either in his face like he, or in a wall behind him. Like it can't be. They never found it. So it got yanked out of him, probably. Did it? I don't know. I'm or like theories. It, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. It's like they never found that. They found other bullets like a month later because they didn't do a good job of searching the scene. <laughs> Uh, they found two other bullets a month later. One was in a carpet when the cleaning crew found it. And then another was in the ceiling. And somebody who, a friend who went in the house found it. This is like uh, making a murderer type shit. Oh yeah, dude. If it, You know what? If this had been a real case and he was alive, it would have got thrown out. It would have never even made it to trial because of the work that was done is so sloppy. Yeah. It would have just, it would have never had a chance. That's fucking wild. Oh wow. So that was, all right. So yeah, like I said, all right, interesting. I didn't know all that extra detail stuff about like the hands and arm and dog and stuff. Oh dude, it's, it's wild. So there is, there are a bunch of groups online. If you go on Facebook, you'll find like five or 10 groups. There's like literally thousands of people following this. And it's interesting that none of us ever, ever talk about it. Except maybe, me. Maybe, maybe cause it's too fucking dicey and just too like, it is maybe, I, I mean, cause, cause it's a lot when you're like, uh, Oh, the guy that they're saying killed his family didn't do it. And here's why it's, yeah. it's always, it, again, it's like, we'll go back to before of pushing on someone's beliefs, right? Mm-hmm. Cause you don't want to yeah. believe that some, there's some mysterious murder from this guy. It's way easier to go, ah, PTSD from the army. Yeah. It's much easier. Right. And I look at it like, I don't really know. Maybe that did happen, but I just think, you know, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered that have never been answered. And I look at it, I'm like, well, I've, I have like 500 pages worth of questions and they have never been answered. It's like, you know, that's a lot of questions to have. And, it, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't want to like sound like a conspiracy theorist because I, I don't really think there was a conspiracy per se. I think it was just a combination of different things, but it's really unfortunate that, yeah, like, you know, this guy was pushing to do 
you know, make a movie and do all these things. And that was another thing they said his movie had fallen apart, his movie deal, but he was in the works of making a TV deal to turn right. his story into a TV series. So it's like, none of these things make sense. All this stuff was going on in the background, but it kind of just got swept under the rug. So I would like to see more people talk about it because I do think it's, it's interesting and it's something that, you know, maybe eventually if enough people push, they'll reopen this thing and actually look into it properly. Dude, um, maybe you should try to get in touch with Sam Tripoli and talk to him about this. Because he yeah. does uh, a lot of... I just had him... I, I'll, I'll shoot him a DM, see if he... Because if he, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm thinking he would be interested in. Maybe, possibly. Yeah, uh, definitely. Because uh, you, be... you know a lot about it. I mean, it's, it's something, something to think about. I'll, I'll, shoot, I'll shoot him a DM for sure. Because that's like a great... I think it's like a, you do a whole hour and a half podcast on that. Oh yeah, for sure. There's there's a lot of material there. There Dude, definitely is. Fuck yeah, man. That's that's crazy. That's nuts. Yeah, we should have to talk about that more. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> man. Anytime. For sure. Anytime. Uh, Josh, I know you gotta get out of here. Tell everybody where they can find you and get your book and your social media and all that great stuff. Yeah, man. Well, uh, if you're looking to pick up the book, Second Story Work, it's on Amazon. Uh, it's an ebook and paperback form. And then if you want to uh, follow me, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Author Josh Sabalski. Boom. Guys, go follow Josh. He's fucking awesome. And uh, again, follow me at Adam Nutter on all the stuff. Uh, catch me out when I'm on the road doing shows. And again, uh, August 14th, pop in. Chalfont, PA, right outside of Philly. Droptent.com slash events. Get your tickets. Josh, thank you, brother, for coming on. Thanks a lot, dude. I appreciate it. Peace out, everyone. Thanks for listening. Find Adam on social media, Twitter and IG at Adam Nutter or Facebook and TikTok at Adam Nutter Comedy. And for podcasts and merch, check out www.droptent.com. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss an episode.